Hey everyone, quick little announcement here from Fish in the DMV. Our weekend warrior package on Patreon is nearly full. There are only 48 spots still available. Once these spots are gone, they're gone, and the weekend warrior tier will be closed to the general public. All members will be locked in indefinitely at a fantastic price point, and they will get all the benefits that they have today, plus any new benefits and discounts that will be added in the future. All weekend warriors will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rod. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, loads of members only content. And in 2025, there are going to be tournaments that will be given a massive discount specifically to our weekend warrior members. Plus, if you sign up for the year right now, you will get 8% off your already fantastically discounted rate to join the Weekend Warrior program. Link in the episode description. Thank you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, and today I'm joined by the Northern Virginia Kayak Association, MVKBA Angler of the Year, Justin Butler. Justin, what a crazy year that you had. Um, I just want to get straight into it here. And and to get started, like, how did you get your way into this kayak tournament scene? Um, So I, um, I grew up bass fishing. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, my dad taught me all the way up until I was about 10 years old. Then he passed away. But uh, my mom was telling me stories of she, uh, my dad had me on the playpen on the boat and stuff um, out there. Um, but uh, fast forward to uh, 10 years old, my dad passed away. Um, and then I didn't get to really go fishing again until I was about 19. Um, so uh, and then I had already joined the military when I was 18. Uh, 19 got to my first duty station in New Orleans and then I started uh, you know I was like hey, I am gonna get back into fishing but I think what I'm gonna do throughout my military career I'm gonna start going to all these different places and I'm gonna figure out what the um, what what's what's the popular sport fish out there and how can I get good at catching them oh, cool. uh, so my first duty station was New Orleans so I really got into red fishing at first it started from the bank but then i'd see like the marsh and everything and i was like man i just got to get out there so i so i got me a uh, a cheap kayak off facebook marketplace i think it was a field and stream egan talon um just something to get me out there and then i started finally catching some redfish and everything and then i was like well i'm i'm doing pretty good um in my eyes but i just want to see where i'm at uh compared to everybody else like how am i actually doing so I, then i started looking around i got involved with the club it's a bayou coast kayak fishing club hmm. um so it was a it's a redfish trail they do redfish uh speckled trout and then they also do flounder for certain events but it's mostly redfish so i got real into heavy with that uh just stalking redfish like in shallow water uh, pulling around the marsh stuff uh and then i moved to colorado uh, I left the kayak behind Louisiana. I couldn't take it with me. Um, but I got into fly fishing out there. Huh. And uh, so I got really good at that. Well, I wouldn't say really good because fly fishing is a different beast than conventional or whatever. But uh did that. I'd go up to like the uh, the high altitude lakes and everything. Stuff you got to like take like a four by four. You got to hike in or something, stuff like that and do all that. And then uh, fast forward four years later, I came out here. And I was like, I wanted to, I grew up bass fishing. I didn't really get to do it in Louisiana um, too much because I was focused on inshore stuff. So I was like, I'm going to get back into bass fishing. So last year I joined the club. Um, like, and it was my first event. Uh, I did okay last year. I think I got third place for rookie, rookie of the year in my standings. Um, but I took that as I'm just, I'm not from here. I'm not, I'm not local to here. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to see how each of these places sets up. And then at the end of the year, last year, I, uh, I told everybody, uh, this year's going to be my redemption year, this upcoming year. And, uh, yeah. So angle of the year for this year. What is red fishing like? Because I feel like if you, if you kind of spend so much time in the saltwater redfish spec trout, it must make bass sometimes like boring. Cause those things just fight so hard. 
Yeah, they do. Uh, the funny thing is, uh, coming from a bass fishing background, uh, most of the lures I use were were bass fishing lures. So I had to take like a uh, like the Strike King race tails, uh, stuff like that, and I throw it on a jig head, just bounce it on bottom, and whatever it is, those those claws, they just go like this in the water, it just drives them crazy. Um, they just instantly commit to it. Um, but that's pretty fun. It's it's a lot of sight fishing if you want to be really good at it. So it kind of combines to my favorite thing, hunting and fishing, because you're you're trying to be quiet. You're trying to like pull through the marsh and everything. You're, you're trying to watch how much wake you're leaving on the water because you don't want to spook those fish out. And you're just eventually you get so good at it, you're just hand selecting fish that you want for your tournament. It's it is insane. And, and they fight crazy, too. Generally speaking, what size line are you using for them? Are you up in the 20 to 30 pound area or, or where? Um, so I used to use, um, back when I first started, I'd use like uh, monofilament because that's what I grew up on. But that stuff's kind of light. But eventually I just use straight 30 pound braid. Mm. So they're not too line shy then, right? No, they don't. No, they don't care. So when you're going from that really like powerful uh, combative type of fishing going to fly fishing and then you get settled into the northern virginia area was what learning curves were there that first year when you were when you were fighting for rookie of the year um honestly it was trying to i was trying to teach myself how to bass fish again i hadn't done it in almost 10 years um so that that right there was the biggest learning curve and i still like i'm feel, i'm still learning like i watched like the amount of preparation that i put into all these events and everything is insane like i probably I like while i'm at work and stuff i listen to podcasts um i watch every time you know a lot of people they sit down they watch tv with their meal or whatever i'm sitting there watching fishing videos all the time um so i i'm and before each event i go on bassresource.com i look up your podcast i look up as many youtube videos as i can and i just get to learning like i'm constantly learning um how to bass fish still um, How do you cipher through the information? Because when I was a kid and, and when we were younger, like you had magazines, but now it's like you said, you could get inundated with so much. Is it sometimes mm -hmm. too much noise? Yeah, it is. Cause like, uh, so the thing with YouTube algorithms and stuff, so, certain things are hot and some things are not. And then sometimes I'll pick up again, like the whole jig head mental thing. And now it's free rig stuff, um, yeah. things like that. Um, so like eventually the hardest part I have is I take in so much information that I, I start forgetting um what i learned so like mm. an event will come up be like oh i should have been cranking laydowns oh i should have used a drop shot why was i doing this instead of that yeah that's crazy because I, I i just keep thinking about that as society advances and stuff and you can have so much information and when is it when is it time for you to get to the lake and just tune out what the dog talk is and just go fishing and start developing that instinct and whether you're a professional or you're just starting out, that's something that you're always going to deliberate with when you start dabbling in the tournament scene. Cause, and there's no right answer to this. There's really not. And especially like me starting this podcast, something that some friends are telling me, it's like, you're going to get hit with more information. And it's actually a curse sometimes because it's hard just to go out there and fish. Um, cause you get so many voices in your head. When you look at going into this year, um, and, I, and I guess the thing we should also talk about is kayak wise. What what was your new kayak setup going into this twenty twenty four season? So going into the twenty four season, um, I uh, when I, well, let me start when I first moved here. When I first moved here, I bought a a, a Vibe Shearwater one twenty five. Um, I just wanted something cheap off Facebook Marketplace that would at least get me back on the water. And uh, it it uses the Hobie drive, which I had a Hobie Outback when I was in Louisiana, so it's it's not too far off. Um, but this year I, I picked up a Jackson Cusa FD, um, brand new first brand new kayak I've ever bought. Uh, and I mainly went with that because, um, I still wanted to do the shallow water stuff, but I didn't want to be hitting stuff with my fins. I know they have the kick up fins and everything, but, um, I wanted that instant reverse as well. So that's why I got the, uh, the Jackson Cusa FD. Smart. Now, do you have forward-facing sonar or electronics on it as well? Yeah, so I, I run a uh, I run a Helix uh, 7. It's non-network. Um, whenever I first started, I didn't know about networked or whatever, um, get back into bass fishing. But I run a Helix 7 with side imaging, uh, and now I run a Helix 9 with uh, Mega Live. So I, I have dual, dual, dual graphs on my, on my kayak. So that'll probably come up in conversation later when we talk about the season because, uh, well, I mean, first one up, Lake Anna. 
Um, was this, what was your thoughts going into this event? Uh, Lake Anna, I'm not going to lie. I was nervous. Um, I couldn't really pick up a pattern like I wanted to. Um, so I got I started looking around everything and then I was like, well, last year during the fall, I did really good, um, up Lake. So I was like, you know, it's starting to be pre-spawn again. Let me just go up Lake again. But I don't even think I got all five fish. I think I only had four, um, during that event. Um, so yeah, it's still, I mean, it's a good finish there. Like, yeah, it is weird, man. It, mm -hmm. it can be really good or really bad. Um, it, it, and you always look at the standings and this is whether it's a boat or a kayak event, the top side is going to be extremely heavy. And then as you get down the leaderboard, you can have somebody finish in the top 20 with, with not even filling out a limit. It's just, it's a weird place how it sets up. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the next one, the Potomac river, that's the first one I got into going from the clear water to to the tidal thing did you get to practice for that one much? so I, I didn't really get to practice at all for that so since i didn't get to practice i went i went back where i went last year which is quantico um okay. there's a uh, there's a grass flat out there um that not too many people hit um and it could be it could be sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad to that this year during that time it, it, it just wasn't picking up like it should have been uh, i definitely think more up river was playing yeah that's what's weird about the potomac um and then spoiler guys if you're listening generally there's always a bay or a creek that's on there because it's not like the james where you get these really narrow creeks these are massive like spawning bays and so you know the beach down at a quiet creek it'll have a time it'll hit off or pohick or belmont um and it's about just hitting the right bay at the right time honestly and that's kind of what 80 percent of the battle honestly um but you got two events down your second year where's your mindset right now um so to be honest with you i, I didn't think it was going that well i was like oh i'm just gonna have a year like last year but that's okay because i'm, I'm still learning um yeah. so i um i took the pressure off of trying to win each event and then i was like well let me just see if i can just place pretty decent top 25 each event i'll be happy that's a good mindset to have, honestly, mm -hmm. not to putting that much pressure on yourself early because, you know, the pressure cooker is definitely going to be cranking up here because we've gotten the first two events out. Where are you in the standings right now going into the Shenandoah? Um, definitely not on top, I don't believe. I'm probably down in um, somewhere between 10th and 15th place if I had to guess. Okay, okay. so yeah, you're, you're right there being competitive. And now we make the small mouth swing were you i mean what is your vibe with smallmouth honestly like that's a completely different thing that a lot of people struggle with so um whenever i talk about fishing different for fish for different species and getting good at each um smallmouth to me is kind of like trout fishing because they almost set up in the same stuff um as trout do um so i didn't really feel too uncomfortable there like i, I knew where the fish were um in their typical habitat um, but I wasn't catching the right size that I needed during pre-fishing. Uh, during pre-fishing, me and a bunch of guys, we'd go out like every other weekend and just go float the Shenandoah. I mean, yeah, the Shenandoah Smart. with each other and just have fun. Uh, it wasn't too competitive out there. Thing. We just a bunch, just bunch of dudes from the club just having a good time. Smart. So you kind of like were – you got a feel for the river mm -hmm. in your section. What happened in that event for you? So during that event, um, I, I just went with the flute. Um, during pre-fishing, I was throwing just the all-white flute, you know, the, the standard staple. Um, but during that event, I was like, you know, these 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 fish have seen a lot of white flukes here recently. Let me just let me just make it just a little bit different. So I switched to the um, the bait fish colored flute, which is Smart. more like a gray on top with like um, some some sparkle in there and everything, and just white on the bottom. Um, that actually turned out pretty good. I was, I was catching, you know, about 14s and 15s, uh, all day. Um, but my real kicker came from a spot. I did not think a red, uh, not sorry, a small mouth would come from. Um, it was on a ledge. Um, there was water pushing over like a rock about the size of a basketball, just straight into it. And it was kind of turbulent down in there. I was like, so I was already anchored with my, um, with my, uh, anchor wizard. And everything so i was like 
I've already hit everywhere in this ledge. So let me just throw up in there because I remember I've caught trout at the bottom of waterfalls before, uh, which I would not think they'd be in there. But I threw it in there, and then I caught a 18 inch smallmouth, which is the kicker that I really need. Yeah, um, that's a big one. And that put me in a, a seventh place finish on there, which mm. I wasn't expecting, but I'll I'll take that. That's some heavy hitters too. Some smallmouth guys up there. When you're throwing the fluke, one one issue I've always had with the fluke is again, uh, especially if you're hooking it weedless. When you're when you're ripping that thing, unlike a jerk bait, when you hit them, boom, you got them because of the trouble hooks. A lot of times, I felt like with the fluke, you almost have to have a softer jerk so you can almost feel if there's one on there so then you can actually set the hook otherwise you might pull it out of their mouths did you have any issues with your hookup ratio no uh well at first i did um so what i do i do like a twitch twitch and then i let it pause and then before instead of twitching it again i'll, I'll slowly roll up to see if there's any smart. any any weight on the line and if there is i'll set the hook smart because yeah if you younger listeners are listening or people that aren't used to fluke fishing if you're having problems with the fluke, that's the number one thing is don't just go back to just ripping on it, especially if you have a weedless hook, because you will miss so many fish because you're just basically going to rip that right out of their mouth. What were you throwing that on uh, setup wise? Um, I was throwing it on just a seven foot medium, seven, three medium. I'm pretty sure. It's just a light uh, line. Yeah. Light line. I use, um, I was actually throwing a, um, just, I think it was about 12 pound fluoro. Oh, okay. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that 18, oof, man. Yeah. That, that's a clutch fish on the river for mm-hmm. sure. I, I mean, that's got to really restore your confidence going to the first battle of five lakes tournaments to crack another a top 10 like that. Now we have to go to Occoquan Reservoir, Sleater's Lake, Germantown, Burke, I guess it's almost like the halfway mark of the season. We're getting close to it. So mm-hmm. what is your practice and the way that you're going to approach this event? So um, I told myself going into the event, I'll, I believe that the, the winning bag is going to come out of Aquacorn, Um yeah. because Safe you watch SB fish and he's catching freaking toads out there. Yeah. Um, um, so I was like, I'm not very good at this place, but I needed to learn this place. So I went out there, um, tried to learn it. Uh, around this time, I had also picked up my forward-facing sonar. Um, went out there, try to try to learn it. I just could, I couldn't get anything consistent out there. And there's and there's so much bait fish out there. Being brand new to forward-facing sonar, it was just, it was kind of, you know, um, a little bit confusing out there. You get a little disoriented. Um, so I was like, well, I learned this place, but I had also I had pre-fished on Sleater. And uh, Abel as well. So I went out to Abel Lake. I couldn't really get on a bite out there. It was really weird. The only bite I could get out there was throwing a shaky head in the grass and just shaking it. Um, that's but they were all smaller fish, so I didn't. I was like, I'm not. I'm not coming to this place. So I told myself, if I don't, um, if I don't do good, if I can't find the pattern on Aquacon and get really good at it, I'm gonna go to Sleater Lake and I'm gonna get my five. Um, just to, just to stay competitive for AOY, because mm-hmm. um, I feel like with my weakest events, I need to figure it out. I need to go where I can at least get five. And I might not be be able to win, but at least I can get five and stay still stay competitive. That's the thing with Sleaters when you do the five lake tournament is it's there's so many fish in there. Like you should be able to catch five. And unlike a a, a Mooney on the other end of the spectrum, where they're ninety nine percent of them are out floating in the ether. There's a really good shallow bite there year mm-hmm. round. Um, and that was a really smart decision. There was a lot of fish caught out of Sleaters that I was shocked at how many competitors were there and just again how many people caught freaking fish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so with that with that event, it's kind of weird. And I've I've never thrown this beforehand, so don't judge me. All right. So I found a really good Ned Root bite out there. Uh I switched between two different colors because when they wasn't on one color, they were on the other. And mm-hmm. just, just different times throughout the day. The other one, one of them was uh, the Copper Truce, um, just by the Z Man Ned, and the other one was it's called Gobi by um, Rapala's uh, Ned BLT or whatever it is. Hmm. So I'd go out there, just just reel it, just let it tap bottom. Um, but what I also found is you can you can hover rig a Ned rig out there, 
and do quite well. Um, so rigs are deadly for that, man. Yeah, deadly. So that that was that was really surprising for me. I was like, man, I'm getting all these fish on uh, hovering a Ned rig instead of hovering like you know whatever other hover rig bait out there. Um, it's so boring, and I think that's mm-hmm. what. I mean, again, what makes a Ned rig so deadly on the bottom, I think is what makes it so deadly when you suspend it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just the, its profile is perfect. Its action is perfect for that. Um, were, were you the one out there scoping in the middle of Sleeters? Okay, that's what I thought. Scoping with a Ned rig. I felt, I felt like a dirty human being after that. <laughs> I bumped into John who who fishes that like a lot. And, and I was telling him, was like, he either just won the event or he's way out in left field. It's one of the two. Because you had that to yourself basically mm-hmm. all all day. <laughs> Yeah, so I so funny thing is this was my second time having forward facing sonar out on the water um, was during that event. Um, so I I brought it with me just because you know I'm still trying to learn it, but I know there's I know how to get my five already with the net rig. So what I started doing, I started um, I found fish deeper, and I was messing with them, um, just hovering that net rig in front of them, and I was getting bites, but really um, it didn't help me too much to be honest with you out there because it's all grass and stuff. Um, it's real clear, but what was really cool out there, I'd take that Ned rig and I'd, I, cause you could see down there, it's almost as clear as Mooney. You could see all that grass down there. So I pitched that Ned rig in the holes and just, just shake it in the holes. And like, I'd see like the bass and stuff weaving through and just like slamming it, like right below my kayak. It was, it was pretty fun. So freaking cool, man. Mm-hmm. And it's good practice. Cause there will be events on this schedule where, that's going to come into major play. Mm-hmm. Um, where did you finish in that event? Uh, looking at it here, I I tied for fifth. Um, the other guy he had the bigger fish, so I got six. Uh, again, like for Sleeters, like huge shout out to that place because the fact that there's so many people that did finish the top ten from Sleeters, when you have Burke Lake and, and Aquaquan Res in the schedule, like that's surprising. But again, I think the problem with Aquaquan Reservoir is for a kayak event, it's a big freaking place to try to break down in a kayak when you could have spots that are so Mm -hmm. far apart for electric motor uh very deceptive i think oh yeah the next one we got the potomac river again you had two back-to-back top tens you must be feeling pretty good at this point yeah i was feeling good i think that's when they were um i think that's when they revealed who was leading for aoy and then i was like oh okay cool and but then they said that i was in second place for aoy and i was like really so I, I didn't know so i was like man i guess i guess i need to kick it in the gear and start start competing at a at a higher level i mean um, but you were already doing so good and i'm always fascinated by this this mindset going into it when like it's like a perfect game like you don't tell people what's going on and you and you basically said like oh crap i'm i'm doing a thing right now i need mm-hmm. i need to now do this this and this were you ever worried at that point that you were going to play head games with yourself and, and overthink it. Uh, I did, but at the same time, I was like, "Look, this is my second. This is my second year bass fishing t- on tournament." So I was like, "The pr- I don't really have any pressure to get AOA. If I do, that's cool. But if I don't, like, I, I still have work to do." Um, but yeah, Potomac River, smallmouth. First time we've been there. So the, so this probably my second or third time fishing there um i didn't really i didn't do good last year um for whatever reason um and this year during pre-fish i couldn't i couldn't really get on a bite i went out with the with a few guys uh scott skinner and lee wells went out with them and um i couldn't i know i wasn't i wasn't doing too great out there it was actually a very hot day the water was low and it was muddy um but i had a saw scott was using uh, something chartreuse. I don't know what it was. Um, so I was like, well, this is my only pre-fish day. Let me just try to figure something out on tournament day. Um, but what I had found, um, I would use, I think it was, I think it's a bandit shallow. A it's a little crankbait, uh, chartreuse black back, probably one of my favorite colors. I throw it out there, even with all the grass and stuff, it wasn't, it wasn't even getting hung up. So I would just throw it out there, bring it across the grass and let it, let it tick the rocks and stuff. And freaking smallmouth were, were just crushing it. Um, yeah, it's insane. Like they, they love those little crankbaits there. Mm-hmm. And if the water was just a little bit higher, man, I really feel like that event would have been even better. I mean, there was still a, a bloody 
ton amount of fish caught at that place mm -hmm. uh, for how few competitors we have. But dude, fourteenth place. That's okay. Like that's not bad. Yeah, that was that was one of my places. I didn't like I said I didn't do too well last year, so I was like I just need to survive. So I just figure out how to get my five, and I, I ended up getting my five. You survived. And yeah. I feel like there was a little bit of, of you being nervous with that one there. Um, we have two more regular season events here. The Battle of Five Lakes, Electric Boogaloo number two. How do you approach this when this one probably has the, the greatest diversity, I think, of the Five Lakes series? So looking back at the, uh, at the other uh, Five Lakes tournament, how Aquacon was there's because there's certain lakes that have the reputation for winning bags um, and just big fish um, on social media and everything. So I was like, I'm not good at Mooney. I went I went there to fish last year. I only got like three fish uh, last year. So I, I devoted an ungodly amount of time pre-fishing this year because I was like, I'm going to learn Mooney. And I ended up fishing every creek arm um, on Mooney. Um and so what I did out there, so like when I first started pre-fishing out there, I want to get two fish here, two fish this day, two fish that day. And then I started getting three, four, five fish. Um, so my my mindset out there was, okay, I'm starting to figure this place out. I'm using my forward facing sonar out there and I'm, I'm finding these bigger fish. Um, so what I did, I, that's when I started telling myself, I need to stick to a game plan because this lake is a little bit bigger than the Sleeters and everything. So I really need to stick to a, a schedule if I'm going to be successful out here. So I, I probably had about 12, 13 spots um, picked out where I had the right size fish, which I was thinking at least 15 inches or, or above. And pre-fishing, um, I actually had my heart broke out there. I probably lost like a seven or eight pounder um, twice out there in different spots. Um, so I was like, okay, I have two big fish spots, but come tournament day, my big fish wasn't out there on any of those spots. They had just pushed off, but I had all these spots marked and everything. So I told myself I'm going to hit all these spots. And, uh, if the fish ain't cooperating, I'm, I'm just going to move and just keep moving until I find some that are cooperating. And lo and behold, that they ended up working. Um, I was out there throwing a, just a Texas rig. I think it's a zoom mag two and a watermelon uh, red flake out there, Peg Texas rig. And I was also throwing a drop shot with a robo worm. Um, those are my main two out there. Do you have a brother? No. So everybody, everybody thinks that's that why I'm going to make sure to ask yeah. that. <laughs> no, no, he's, I mean, maybe, I mean, he's, he's a good fisherman too. So, I mean, maybe, maybe my dad is something more funny <laughs> back in the day. Who knows? <laughs> I always had to ask, I had to ask that with the research I was doing. I was like, oh, this is crazy. Like these guys are always close to each other in the standings. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, some brotherly uh, uh, practice there. Mm -hmm. Dude, Mooney is, it, it, again, great fishery, not knocking it, but it is very specifically a, if you have scope, it gives you a hell of an advantage for that place. Um, oh, yeah. You know, you all know that I completely messed up. I should have started it at nine until I get scope on my boat. Um, but again, it's got seven pounders in it. It's got so mm -hmm. many seven pounders. Um, hunting run though, I don't, I really wish I should have practiced there mm -hmm. too. Cause hunting run is also another place. It's when it's on that place is fire as well. Oh yeah. It's got some nice ones in there too. Mm hmm. Uh, dude, it's coming down to the wire here. You get a third place finish. You have. The Rappahannock, you're pretty sure that you know that you're going to be fishing the classic. So at this mm -hmm. point, I'm assuming you're thinking Rappahannock Lake Anna. And I'm not trying to get the car before our horse, but we have a lot of time behind the steering wheel driving back from events. Were you more worried about the Rappahannock or Lake Anna? Honestly, the uh, the Rappahannock, because last year I did not do good at all. Um, last year I couldn't get a bite pre-fishing. Um, and then during the tournament, I had caught one dink. But... Uh, I think my biggest issue, because last year I fished way south. I went like almost to the boundary and everything up a creek. Um, like I was catching blue crabs and pre-fishing out there. It was so far back. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was it was rough. Um, but this year I was like, I'm not going to go all the way down there. I'm going to go where the salinity is lower. Um, so I, I bounced between Hop Yard and, and Hicks. Uh, and th I think there's another place I fished up, up above Hop Yard or Hicks. 
it's whatever's one above. Oh, Little Falls. I pre-fished there. Didn't really do good at, at Little Falls, so I ended up going to Hop Yard. Um, but I I had found a weird bite out there. It was all on laydowns. Um, but what I, I did something a little different because I wanted a I wanted a spinner bait, but I couldn't find the exact one I wanted, which was just you know just the um, the willow blade, just one single willow blade, um, gold. Um, so what I, I had did reflecting back on my redfish experience, I, I, I found a H and H redfish spinner and attached it to a jig head with a kite tech on the back. And I would hmm. throw that out there into the middle of these laydowns. And if it didn't get hung up on the wood, a, a fish was going to eat it. it. It was so weird. Um, so I did that. And I also found out um, Z man has these willow blade, willow vibe jig heads, which is basically like a little chatter bait. Um, but I would put like a, uh, I think it's a two and a half inch or three inch Kitek on the back. Hmm. Um, because I had heard that on the right panic, they like, kind of, they kind of like smaller stuff. And so I, I realized I really needed to downsize out there. How did you get on that? That is such a brilliant idea. Like what made you think about going to that redfish bait? Um, cause I wanted, I wanted something that was a little bit more subtle. Uh, I know Scott Skinner last year talked about a um, an underspin. Yeah, but you know, I figured, you know, with the with the podcast coming out, I was like, wonder, I wonder how many underspins they've seen, how many how many freaking redfish spinners have they seen? Probably probably like zero. Zero. Yeah. So that that's where I went at with that. That place is crazy. I mean, again, like how much that current rips there? Like I I you don't see that on the Potomac mm-hmm. where it gets too fast. And there are some tidal rivers where that's the case where when that current gets ripping, like it shuts the bite off. Like there's a oh, certain yeah. current flow in which they're going to actually feed on. Um, yeah. You, you cannot just show up there game day and have as much as says you, that's the place you really need to put your homework oh, yeah. in. You survived. Survived. We're now down to the final thing. It, it how much is the head game playing with you right now? Um, so I was actually, I was very thankful that Lake Anno came up as the last event because last year I had done fifth, um, fifth place. And, uh, so I, I went out during pre-fishing. I had three different days of pre-fishing out there. So I, I, first I went out there. Let me just see if my pattern from last year still holds because fishing my history, um, last year on the Potomac for my history from last year on the Potomac this year, it hurt me which gave me a 26th place finish. So I was like, let me just go check just so I don't hurt myself during game day. Um, and I went out there cranking some lay downs in an area up like, um, and they, they were just, they were still hitting on it. Um, so I was, I was very thankful for that. Um, I couldn't get on my swim jig bite that I had last year. Um, so I didn't even pick up a swim jig. So during this term, I just locked in a bandit 200. I was just cranking lay downs all day. Why do you think the swim jig bite wasn't there this year? Because with the water up, the willow, it seems like it'd be perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I I have no idea. I I just I just couldn't get anything on it. I would get on a swim jig bite in the grass, but whenever it came to like laydowns, I I just couldn't get on it. It seems like you prefer wood versus grass. Is is that a fair assessment? Yeah, because like I don't know what it is, but when a crankbait just hits that and it comes over the log or whatever, and you just see like a big old large mount just come and take it it's it's pretty fun yeah my biggest regret if i wasn't just gonna lock in the glide bait i probably would have gone up lake and just run the willow because there were so many fish Mm -hmm. that were locked into that fresh stuff and honestly if the tournament was a week before when the water was really up i feel like that shallow water bite would have been even more fire than it was Mm -hmm. yeah and i I had also found um some good fish fishing just the rock out there different rock piles and stuff um like very shallow stuff that like you could probably hit your boat on if you're not careful and just fishing a little bit deeper off of that i'd actually stuck like a five and a half pounder out there during (sighs) pre-fishing just just speed cranking over these boulders and stuff how do you break down a lake like that in a kayak I, i mean how many days of practice do you have like what is your process um, so my process is I, I look at the time of the year and then based on the time of year, I was like, what are these fish doing? Uh, it's the fall. They're moving up shallow. Um, so, and then I would start going to look on a map. So my process for Anna is like really weird. I know, I know there's a dock bite and everything and I feel like docks are, 
they probably play a bunch on Anna, on Anna, but my process thinking on Anna was I'm not, you know, how many people come to Anna and want to fish a dock? Probably just about everybody. Mm -hmm. I know whenever I first went to Anna, that's where I wanted to go. So what I did, I try to find the super sneaky stuff. Um, I try to find shoreline that doesn't have development on it. Um, and that's, that's where I focus on. Cause I, cause like I'd watch boat stuff. They'd go hit the docks over here, but they wouldn't go hit the, the wood, the, the trees and stuff over here. Yeah. And, and you really have to pick your areas. So you gotta be so efficient with how you pick your areas because you can't run 38 points, generally speaking, um, with, with a kayak, no matter how big your battery is, it's just so much time in between spots compared to mm -hmm. some of these bass boat guys. The, the one thing, again, I, I keep realizing is how many fish are in some of these damn creeks. Um, I mean, I was in like Riley and um, Josh to, to name a few were in Sturgeon with me. You know, those two guys, top 10, one got second. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of boats in there. I had some fish that I should have I should have got. And this is one damn creek. It, it, it If I had a boat, I wouldn't have done that. I would have mm -hmm. left. But when you do those circles, you get those micro patterns within the day where like they moved a little bit. Now they're setting up here. Like this dock is hot. You can hit this dock twice in a day and probably get bit. Uh, I don't know. It's fascinating about changing the way my brain looks at it. It's not just the pattern across the lake, but it's a pattern within just a small area as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's just starting to really make me rethink things. When did you know, or did you ever know? For what, AOI? Yeah. Um. So coming into this event, I, I did the math. I think I needed a place at least, I want to say about 10, 10 places higher than the next guy. And the guy I overtook for AOI, he was he actually beat me on this event last year. And he's a he's a stick. So I was like, there's no way. And then I looked at the the leaderboard or whatever. I saw he had like two fish um, throughout the day. And I was like, I was like, oh no, he's sandbagging. He's got to be sandbagging. But um, he ended up not finding his other fish, and that's that's where I I, I got AOI. <sighs> Did it ever, what, what, did you have those two points? Cause to me, it's like when you realize you won and then you drive home and it's like, I just did a thing. Like when did it really kind of take over you? Was it when you had that big trophy and we were all applauding when you was in a car, when you could reflect on your whole year? Honestly, it was the next day. Cause I was like, there's no way I just did this. Like this isn't <laughs> real. And I woke up and I walked to my room and I saw the trophy in my room. I was like, I really, I really just did this. And it's awesome. Was there one event that looking back on, oh, this saved my ass? Um, I, I think probably the Mooney event because I got a really? third place finish on there. Um, and, and that was one of the ones I was kind of stressed out about because I didn't do too hot there. Um, and then the rap, the rap, the rap really saved my butt out there. Because if I if I didn't do somewhat decent, you know, place it, um, just place decent, then I'm not I'm not getting AOI for this. It's isn't that crazy? I mean, like, and then you go to like, I mean, it's it's I just love this analysis of an AOI is so much different than a tournament because it's so long. It's such a it's such a, a marathon. Because mm -hmm. I could even bring up like the Upper Potomac. You were never there. You didn't tie on a crankbait. And you just didn't catch enough big ones. You caught the 18 inch smallmouth at the Shenandoah, which jumped you in the top 10, like 118. Like it's, I, I even come up with these different things that sprinkle it in there. Mm -hmm. um, it's all those moments that have to connect or you just don't miss fish. Like things that, I don't know, you set the hook and it jumps and it spits. It happens a thousand times, but this mm -hmm. year it doesn't. It's so crazy how many of those things have to line up. Oh yeah. Yeah. You've, you've got to be really organized on your kayak. You Like your gear has to be, dialed in for kayak fish and if not if you if everything doesn't have its place on the kayak like your net doesn't go where it needs to go your your use base yep. don't go where it needs to go like there's so many different things you could start losing fish and it's it, it'll hurt you bad was the ned rig a bait that you used uh throughout the season or maybe i can i can reword this was there something that seemed to bail you out like every event that you'd have tied on just as a comfort bait um I would say during the during the Potomac event, the uh, the title Potomac, I I split the Cinco. I couldn't get on anything. Um, last year it was I had a Kitek just just reeling it through the grass. Um, I couldn't get onto that this year, so I just I would look at the submerged grass and just flip the Cinco in it. Um, 
But honestly, I think probably my biggest player was just a Texas rig. Just using that. How did you keep that so simple? Because everyone likes to overthink it like with a jig or something like that. But a Texas rig, it is. Peanut butter and jelly. Mm-hmm. It will work everywhere. Because So I, I started messing with like JDM plastics and everything. Oh. And I was like, man, honestly, like I don't, I don't need to spend $20 on some Japanese dice just to go out and catch these fish. <laughs> you know, I could let the, the Texas rig is tried and true. Let me just, let me just do that. I, yeah. Cause like uh, where the dice are going to work is just such a niche mm-hmm. area where you get highly pressured fish. And if you're going to a, a, a Sleeters or, you know, the title of Potomac, I, I don't think we're at that level of pressure yet, especially when our tournaments are that you're going to need to get super duper creative. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, that that's smart. Like to me, it was like that screw lock swim bait. Like God knows how many times there was a shallow, bite I could do that. I mm-hmm. never thought of just a weightless plastic. It's always a frog or, mm-hmm. or some kind of top water like that. And until you fish a whole season, you don't realize these little patterns that you start having yourself where you just subconsciously always tie this bait on. It's mm-hmm. just, I, I think about that now more of years past. What's a bait I tied on that maybe I didn't think about, but I always had it on my my deck of the boat or in the kayak. Um, I think last year it was like a, um, a heavier Ned rig for me. It was like two years ago. This year was that screw lock bait. And I don't know if it's because it works or if it's just because you get confidence in it there. Clearly the screw lock for me worked, but like the Ned rig last year, two years ago, I think I had only two good events with it, but then I just kept it locked in because I had the two good events, even though it's probably the, the worst choice. I probably should have gone with a shaky head at some places, Mm -hmm. but because I had the two events early that were good, well, clearly I have to have it there. And I think we get in our, our heads too much about comfort bait sometimes as well, but yeah, that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down. Yeah. Um, what, Justin, congratulations. I mean, 2024 Northern Virginia Kayak Association Angler of the Year. What do you got planned for next year? So next year, um, I'm actually moving to Tennessee during the summer. So if, if you're trying to take AOI from me, congrats. I already took it from myself. <laughs> oh, but, man. Um, I do plan on fishing to at least May or June. Um, and then I'll move to Tennessee and join some, some KVF clubs out there for work. Yeah. For work. I'm getting out of the military. Mm, well, at least you can finally settle down somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I'll so, be out on a uh, Lake Chickamauga and Watts bar and probably gunners. Ooh, and that'll uh, be fun to figure that out. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's actually where I grew up fishing and stuff. Oh really? I didn't know you're from there. Yeah. Well, I'm from North Georgia, but Tennessee, the, all the TVA lakes are pretty good. Gotcha, gotcha. Drive. Yeah, like, I mean, those, those are a whole other animal to deal with too, those mm-hmm. those TVA systems, um, just with the current flow and how big they are. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I would even think like you probably have to up- – would you upgrade your kayak or keep the kayak that you have? Um, so eventually I do want to get a PA-14 eventually. Uh, my current living situation right now, I kind of don't have room for a PA right now. Um, but that's probably where I'm going to end up gravitating towards. But I think before that, I'm probably going to get an XI3 because I want spot lock. That's huge. I've been wondering like if a spot lock would be... I think a spot lock would be better for those big lakes like that versus mm-hmm. if you're fishing the Shenandoah River, the Torquedo vibe is oh, probably yeah. better. Yeah. Um, I think I saw Eddie out there on Nye with that trolling motor. I'm like, dude, that's... If you're just fishing like a Mooney place, that's so freaking smart to have that mm-hmm. ability. That's great, yeah. But Justin, again, I really appreciate it. Um, as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Go check out Northern Virginia Kayak Association. They're a fantastic club. Uh, if you'd like to, go check us out on Patreon. If it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. So like, subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.